Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're watching online, good morning to you. If you're watching on YouTube later, great to have you listening in. This morning, uh, we'll be in Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 21. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles, we'll read together. And I've titled our message, Jesus, Our Propitiation. It's not a word that we use very often or if all. You know, at all, we may not know what it means, but <clears throat> if we don't, we'll know what it means. It's a great word, has a wonderful meaning for us, and it's what this passage, one of the things it's all about, Jesus, our propitiation. So if you're there with me, uh, I'm going to read the first uh, few verses together. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be, the, be just <clears throat> and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I had a pastor who used to say, I love the butts of the Bible. And now if you were sleeping, that might have caught your attention. <laughs> well, let me, let me give you just a few examples. And you, you might have heard that before. Maybe you never have. Here's a few examples. Acts 7, 9 through 10. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. That's the bad news. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. 1 Samuel 23, 14. David stayed in the desert strongholds and in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him. But God did not give David into his hands. Are you starting to recognize a pattern? Jonah 2.6. This was Jonah's cry from the belly of the great fish. To the roots of the mountain I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. One more, Psalm seventy-three twenty-six. My flesh and heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. In all of these passages, what is the common denominator between Joseph and David and Jonah and the psalmist Asaph? Whether brought on by their own sin and disobedience or someone else's, they all experienced circumstances that were overwhelming and terrifying and life-threatening. Circumstances that in their own ability and resources, they were powerless to overcome. Situations that were impossible to alter or rescue themselves from in their own strength. So what happened? What was the end of the story for them? Their final scene. Did it end in death and defeat? 
Not at all. In every situation, when all hope might have been lost, God intervened. But God was an ever-present help in time of trouble for Joseph. But God never left nor abandoned David to the schemes of his enemy Saul. But God brought Jonah up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay. But God was Asaph's portion and the strength of his heart, no matter how the wicked seemed to temporarily prosper. No matter how bad the situation is, no matter how dire the news is, when God enters the equation, you can forget about everything prior to that moment. He has the power to set aside the impossible in our lives. And I heard a pastor say, when he does counseling with people, he's listening for that transition, for that word. But they'll come and they'll start to lay out this and that and the other and the other and all this stuff, this whole scenario, right? And on and on. And he's waiting and he's listening until they say, but, and it's the indication all the stuff I said before doesn't really matter. This is what I really want to talk about. This is the heart of the issue, the heart of the matter. And I love that. That's you. If you want to do a cool study, study all the buts in the Bible. And not only that, there's many that say, but God. This and this and this happened, and it was going to be a complete disaster. It was going to be the end. But God. So it means, I don't care. Whatever the circumstance looked like now, God's about to do what only he can do in the situation. Getting back to Romans and the gospel of Christ, that Paul, he's sharing with the church in Rome. What's the impossible situation that he's laying out that every person, every one of us, everyone in human history, they find themselves in this situation? The condition that we are powerless to alter, that we cannot undo, that we cannot change, whether Jew or Gentile. The bad news of the gospel is that apart from Christ, we all stand guilty head to toe before a righteous God. We are dead in our sins and our trespasses, the Bible says. Unable to meet the righteous requirements of the law and are by nature children of wrath. As we read in our passage, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what's the only solution to this inescapable, unalterable condition? Just like with Joseph and David and Jonah and Asaph, there has to be a divine intervention. And according to our passage, what form did that intervention take? It came through Jesus Christ our propitiation. And so with that introduction, we come to one of the greatest buts in the Bible. Romans 3, 21. And by the way, I looked it up in about five or six different translations. And every single one starts with this transitional phrase. This is a key phrase. Paul has laid out. He's absolutely proved the case. No matter who you are. When you lived before the law, after the law, whether you're a Jew, whether you're a a Gentile, that 
we are under uh, sin. We're, we're guilty before God. And he's undeniably proved that case. And now he comes to Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. All of us, we're incapable of attaining right standing before God in ourselves. And therefore, the Bible teaches that we're doomed to be consigned to hell. But hang on, there's another truth that can overwhelm and undo and set aside the sinner's guilty verdict. That's the beauty of this passage. They're both equally true. We can't save ourselves. But God wasn't okay with leaving us in that lost, doomed condition. But now the righteousness of God, in other words, the condition in which we can be found acceptable to God, being, being righteous, it means we're in the condition that is acceptable to God. Apart from the impossible task of keeping the law is revealed. The righteousness of God that the Old Testament law pointed to in all the types and the shadows of the sacrificial system that required the shedding of blood for atonement. He's revealing the righteousness of God that the Old Testament prophets, they directly foretold. And so it was both, it was both foreshadowed and pointing, pointed to in symbolism and in types and metaphors and shadows. But then God also just flat out told us it was coming by direct revelation of the prophets. One of them was in Isaiah 51, 5 through 6. God says, my mercy and justice are coming soon. My salvation is on the way. My strong arm will bring justice to the nations. All distant lands will look to me and wait in hope for my powerful arm. Look up to the skies and gaze down on the earth below. For the skies will disappear like smoke and the earth will wear out like a piece of clothing. The people of the earth will die like flies, but my salvation lasts forever. My righteous rule will never end. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, <clears throat> being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And here it is. Even the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so what's the solution to our problem? How do we find acquittal and pardon and right standing before a holy God through faith in Jesus Christ? Through trusting and believing in the finished work and person of Jesus Christ, our propitiation. And when we think about that, could it really be as simple as that? Is the solution to our sin problem really that easy? A matter of trust and belief and acceptance of God's message and of his provision. Yes. In Acts 16, when the Philippian jailer fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, he had one burning question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You see, his heart had already been gripped by the Holy Spirit when the great earthquake happened and all the jail cell doors flew open and the chains fell off. And he thought all the prisoners were going to escape. And so he grabbed a sword to take his own life. And they shouted out, Paul said, 
don't do yourself any harm, for we are all here. And he knew in that moment that only God could have done this miraculous event. This was his big time wake up call. The earthquake, the doors flying open, the chains falling off, and all the prisoners don't make a run for it. Everybody was stunned. And his heart is gripped by conviction. He had probably been listening to Paul and Silas singing praise to God about midnight after what they had been gone, you know, gone through and endured. The beating that they had endured and being locked in the inner prison in the deepest part and chained and with the order that was very urgent. You make these guys secure and you make sure they don't escape. And so he took that serious and he beat them and he locked them in the deepest part and locked them in the stocks. And now to be experiencing this and have this conviction. And his question was, what do I have to do to be saved? How did they answer him? How did Paul and Silas answer? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved you and all your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all were, who were in his house. And immediately he and all his family, they were baptized. And they would have never baptized them if they didn't make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. It was as simple as that. They were, he was under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He knew that the God and the message that they served and that they preached was true. And he believed it and received it in his whole household. And that very night they were saved. And the Bible says that they took them and they washed their wounds and they fed them. And then they were baptized. How do we stand acceptable before God? How do we attain righteousness? Because the Bible says that without righteousness, unless Jesus said your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. And they were astounded and they thought who could be saved? How do we stand acceptable? It's a great question. How do we make ourselves right before God? How do we attain righteousness? As Paul states in verse 21, Salvation is not obtained on the basis of law keeping, of keeping all the rules. But verse 22, it's obtained through faith in Jesus Christ. Bill McDonald, he comments on this passage. Faith here means utter reliance on the living Lord Jesus Christ as one's only savior from sin and one's only hope for heaven. It's based on the revelation of the person and work of Jesus Christ as found in the Bible. Faith is not a leap in the dark. It demands the surest evidence and it finds it in the infallible word of God. Faith is not illogical or unreasonable. What's more reasonable than the creature should trust his creator? Faith also is not a meritorious work by which a man earns or deserves salvation. A man cannot boast because he's believed in the Lord. But actually, he would be a fool not to believe in him. See, we, sometimes we have this idea like, hey, I believed in the Lord. <clears throat> Actually, you'd be stupid not to. Really, everybody should. It's what the Bible says, right? That's what Paul established that in chapter 1. What can be known about God is clearly evident and plain and manifest to them because he's revealed it to them. And so men are without excuse. It doesn't come down to we were so enlightened in one sense that we trusted in God. God's made it plain and evident. It comes down to humility and surrender. And that we want to turn away from evil and we want to turn toward God. 
And <clears throat> faith is not an attempt to earn salvation, but it's the simple acceptance of the salvation which God offers as a free gift. So who is this free gift of salvation through faith in Jesus offered to? Who is that offer made available to? All. The availability of the gospel is as universal as its need. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And so it's offered to all. It's available to all. And it's sufficient for all. But it's only effective in, in those who accept Jesus by a definite act of faith. And so the offer is universal, but how many people are just leaving it on the table? As the Bible says, they count themselves unworthy of everlasting life. How many people do that? Turn up their nose and they walk away. Why? Because they want to live for their own selfish desires. It's, it's the, the twisted brokenness of our human nature that we would ever reject such an incredible offer. For God so loved the world that whosoever. How many people is whosoever? It's everyone. It's anyone. If you're a whosoever in this room, that, that's you. I'm a whosoever and you're a whosoever. God so loved the world that anybody, whosoever believes in him, could it really be that easy? Yeah. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now in verses 24 through 26, Paul explains how this free gift of righteousness was obtained by Jesus. We've established that now he's revealing and he's offering a salvation that's independent from works, but it comes through simple faith and obedience to the message. But this was how Jesus obtained it. Verse 24, being justified, that means declared innocent and righteous, freely, that's without any cost, by God's grace, that's through his unmerited favor, through the redemption that's the price that Jesus paid to buy us back that is in Jesus Christ. And so this is how the, uh, the salvation was obtained. So we are declared innocent and righteous without any cost by God's unmerited favor through the price paid by Christ Jesus to buy us back from sin and destruction. What an awesome truth and verse to meditate on. How did Jesus pay the price owed for our sins before God to redeem us? And by the way, when we talk about Jesus paying the price, he's not paying it to anyone. He's not paying it to the devil. He's not paying it to the world. Or, but he's paying it to God to satisfy the requirement of God. And so this payment is more abstract in that sense but it was a payment that needed to be made. How does Jesus pay the price owed for our sins before God to redeem us? Verse 25, God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for our sin to be a propitiation by his blood. And so what is propitiation? It's a sin offering by which the wrath of a deity is appeased. That's what that definition of propitiation is the payment to appease a God or a deity. Under the first covenant, where was the place of propitiation? If you know, don't shout out. But was there, was there a place provi provided for by in the law upon which the propitiatory, it's a hard word to say, propitiatory sacrifice was offered? 
Where was that place? The place of propitiation was the golden lid between the two cherubim covering the Ark of the Covenant that was kept behind the veil in the Holy of Holies or in the most holy place. And that was housed in what? In the tent of meeting, in the tabernacle when they wandered through the wilderness, and then later that was in the temple. But in both places, there was the heavy curtain, the veil. And that place of propitiation was within the veil in the Holy of Holies. And what was kept, and, and by the way, that place of propitiation was known as the mercy seat. It's also called... Uh, you know, the place of atonement. And what was kept inside the Ark of the Covenant? One of the things was the covenant. That's why it's called... Sometimes we can, we can be in church our whole life. Oh, the Ark of the Covenant. We know what it is, but do we know why it's called the Ark of the Covenant? Because the covenant of God was contained inside of it. It's kind of funny. It's kind of ironic. We could... We can be just accustomed and grow up and not really think about what these things mean. The two stone tablets written on by God and given to Moses containing the Ten Commandments. And by the way, there's only two records, as far as I know, of God ever writing on anything. Number one, it was on these two stone tablets, the Ten Commandments. Number two is when Jesus wrote in the dust when, when he said, okay, you guys is condemned this woman caught in the act of adultery whoever's without sin cast the first stone and Jesus knelt down and he began to write into the sand or the dust only two instances and this is one of them the stone tablets were inscribed by God and then put into the ark Exodus 25 21 through 22 this is God's instructions to Moses place inside the ark the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. Then put the atonement cover, put the mercy seat on top uh, of the ark. I will meet with you there and talk to you from above the atonement cover, above the mercy seat, between the golden cherubim that hover over the ark of the covenant. <clears throat> From there, I will give you commands for the people of Israel. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into where? The Holy of Holies and sprinkle the mercy seat with the blood of the animal sacrifice, making propitiation, appeasing God's wrath against Israel's sin until the next year came around. You see, the high priest was required every year to do this annual ritual of going in. First, he would make atonement for his own sin by animal sacrifice, and then he would take the blood in, and he would enter one time a year, only the, whole, the high priest, and he would make atonement for Israel, and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Hebrews 9 really brings this to light about, you see, Paul saying that the, the law and the prophets testify to this righteousness apart from the law being revealed by God. And Hebrews 9, like I said, really brings it home. I'm going to read to you a little bit starting in verse 1. That first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room, there was a lampstand, a table, and sacred loaves of bread on the table, the bread of the presence, the showbread. The room was called the holy place. And then there was a curtain, the veil, and behind the curtain was the second room called the most holy place. And in that room... There was a golden incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. Inside the Ark were a 
gold jar containing manna, Aaron's staff that had sprouted leaves, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of divine glory. And the, by the way, you remember reading, Peter said that this salvation that God was in his heart and plan from the beginning of the world, he said even the angels desired to look into this salvation. That's the picture of the two cherubim. And they're gazing down upon the mercy seat which covered the law. And they were trying to understand and they wanted to look into how is God going to save and redeem the apple of His eye, creation and man. Above the ark were the cherubim of, of divine glory. You see them? And their wings touched, right? And they were looking down. Whose wings stretched over the ark's cover, the place of atonement. But we cannot explain these things in detail now. I can't either because you're going to get too hungry. When these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. So they went into the holy place on a regular basis. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place. And only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins. And for the sins of the people had committed in ignorance. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit. You see, this wasn't man's idea. He didn't come up with a bunch of religious ceremonies. Isn't this beautiful? By these regulations, the Holy Spirit. This was God's plan that was pointing to something. Revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time for the gifts and sacrifice that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations <clears throat> that were in effect only until a better system could be established. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world and with his own blood, not the blood of calves and goats, he entered the most holy place once and for all time and secured our redemption forever. This is God setting forth Jesus as the propitiation, the satisfying payment for our sins. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That's what a propitiation is. The perfect sacrifice for our sins that pleases God. God and makes us right before him and removes that wrath that was upon us. How does God save us? This is the, the imagery is so amazing and beautiful and it's so perfectly fulfilled in Christ, obviously by God's design. How does God save us? By placing his mercy and the blood of Jesus between us and the law of God that condemns us. You see that imagery? The mercy seat covered the law. And upon that, the blood was upon that. And God's mercy, he covered it and he separated us from the law that we could never keep that only condemns us as sinners. And so all that 
the way the tabernacle was arranged, the temple, <clears throat> all the items, all the furnishings, they all had a perfect role to fulfill in pointing to the work, the full work and ministry of Jesus Christ. The satisfying payment that appeases the wrath of God against our unrighteousness has been paid through the shed blood of Jesus. If a person will humble themselves and believe and trust in that great reality, God will declare them righteous before him. The righteousness of God apart from the law has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth to be a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Now, what about those who had lived before Jesus had suffered and died and had been raised from the dead? Where did that leave the Old Testament saints? The second part of verse 25 speaks to that. In his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How was God able to pass over the sins previously committed? By faith, through the blood of an innocent victim, once a year on the Day of Atonement. That's how the Old Testament saints had their sins covered. It was through faith. It took just as much faith to trust that God was not going to strike them and wipe them out by trusting in this blood sacrifice of an animal. Even as we look to Christ, did it not take faith to do that? It's like, well, how does that work? I don't know. It's how God set it up. And if he says he's going to do it, I'm okay with that. If that covers me, I'm going to go with his program. I would have brought my offering. I would have said, hey, high priest, go in there. It's been a rough year. I need you to go in there and do what God's asked you to do. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away the sin of the people, however, but provided temporary covering for sin and appointed to the one who would ultimately accomplish that. It's like if, if God was holding all of our sins right here, And he covered them. They're still there. But they're covered. Correct? But they're not taken away yet. The blood of bulls and goats could never remove the sin. But it was a temporary covering. But it was pointing to the great high priest and the sacrifice that he would make. As John the Bap Baptist prophesied of Jesus, so when he came... You remember, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Didn't say who covers the sin of the world. He removes it. He separates that sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Only Jesus could do that. And so just as we, we look back through 2,000 years back to the cross, but they were looking thousands and hundreds of years, and they died in faith looking forward to His cross and to His satisfying payment. Only His payment could be the propitiation, the thing that pleased God. How is God able to remain just, as our passage says? Meaning, He required that all sin be condemned and paid for by the guilty, and yet be the justifier of condemned sinners. How can he be both just and the justifier? How can he not sweep sin under the carpet, or wink at it, or act like it's no big deal? Because it is a big deal. And yet, at the same time, 
How can, can he declare guilty sinners innocent? Be the one that declares them innocent. Be the justifier to forgive them, those that deserve judgment, by means of the atonement. This was the means, the propitiation of Jesus. Romans 8, 3 through 4, when we get there, Paul's going to say, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, since man is incapable of keeping God's law, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Let me give you one more but from Romans 5. 6 through 9. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight, how? Through the propitiation, by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. <clears throat> Man-made religion, even our best efforts to keep the law in our own power, is only, it's a vain attempt to appease God. But through the propitiation of Christ, you know what we discover? God is already appeased. When we come through the blood of Christ, what do we find? That we're accepted in the beloved. That we have peace with God through the cross of Christ. We're not on this endless, remember we talked about the laws like a treadmill that you can never get off of and you can never achieve. There is no end to it and you can't appease God. That's man-made effort trying. We'll never attain it, we'll never reach it, we'll never satisfy God that way. And that's the message of the gospel. You don't have to try to appease God. If you'll trust in his salvation, in his Savior that he sent, you'll find yourself free and forgiven. And God is not an angry God that you're trying to appease through your works or your service or your sacrifice. You know what? You find yourself free to serve him out of love and gratitude. And that's the Christian life. Not trying to earn a right standing before God, but through Christ finding yourself declared righteous, even though practically we know we have a long way to go. And that process is called sanctification. But positionally, you're declared righteous through that satisfying payment, the propitiation. If you've received that and you, that's your condition, that's your status, that's how you enjoy waking up every day. Don't you just want to share that with other people? You don't have to try to, you know, I can't come to church. If they knew what I did, they would never let me in here. I'm too ashamed of myself. If you knew all that I had done. No, that's, that's the message of condemnation and guilt. And that's the enemy trying to keep people away. God says, I know how bad you are. <laughs> and I knew you could never save yourself. And that's why I sent my son. Because I loved you so much. I did what was impossible. And I was reading through 
one of the great other buts of the Bible, Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God had found a way to never compromise his holiness and his righteousness and his character and who he is. And so when we found him, God was always as we would imagine he would be holy and righteous and awesome to think about standing in his presence and terrifying, perfectly pure, white, hot, holy God without any sin or stain. And yet at the same time, he was also what we always hoped he would be. That free gift. You're a whosoever that God so loved that he sent his son to die for you, that you would not perish if you would believe in him, but you would have everlasting life. And it is so amazing how easy, it's ridiculous how easy God, he's done absolutely everything. And all we have to do is really agree with common sense that he put in our heart and our mind through creation, through conscience, and the proof of the Bible. He's saying all you have to do is agree that you're a mess, you, you're broken all my laws, but I love you and I'll save you. And yet man is so resistant and so hard-hearted and rebellious and stiff-necked that he counts himself unworthy of everlasting life and turns it down and rejects it. And it's, just, it's heartbreaking, but our job is to give the full gospel we have to tell them the bad news. But aren't you glad that there's a but? You're condemned and you are on your way destined for hell forever if you do not receive Jesus Christ. But you don't have to go there because God made a way when it was impossible for us to be saved. He said, don't worry. I provided salvation. It's for everyone. You just need to access it. And so if you've never done that, what are you waiting for? And for all of us that have, we celebrate and we say, thank you, Lord Jesus. You are mighty to save. Everyone needs compassion, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. And that's what He did. We love Him. And that's why we serve Him. Not because we're good or because we all have our acts together. We're working on getting our acts together. Like I said, that's sanctification. God does, he's, he saves us and he's like, let me help you. You need a lot of help. You need to become like my son. It'll be a lot, you know, it's a lot better for your blood pressure, your heart rate. You could sleep at night. You won't get indigestion. You know, you'll probably not earn more wrinkles. You might even, well, maybe you get some laugh wrinkles instead of frown lines and ulcers and everything else. And that's my, that's my uh, message. This is the heart of gospel. How much God loved us. This is the beauty. And learn that word, propitiation. Study it. Look it up in the dictionary. And look in the Bible. God is able to overwhelm any situation but God. I don't care what your situation is. I'm on my deathbed. But God. If He wants you to not die, you won't die. You'll live longer. You know, this and that. I don't care what your situation is interject a but God but God can do the impossible with man it, you know it's impossible but with God all things are possible Joseph if you guys will come up worship team receive his grace walk in his mercy and share the message with others you don't have to be the way you are you can you could be saved you could be changed
if he moved the mountains and he saved you and me. Our God is mighty to save. He can move the mountains and save our loved ones, those that we're praying for, those that we desire to come into his goodness and his grace. Keep on praying. Keep on preaching the word. Keep on reading the scriptures. Keep on believing. Our God is still mighty to save. His arm, as the scriptures say, has not been shortened. He can save even the hardest of hearts. If he can move mountains, like I said, if he can save all the tough cases in the room, then he can save our family, our loved ones, our friends. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you that you made a way where there was no way. You, you saved us. You're the God of our salvation. And Lord, you're going to save who knows how many today and the next day. And you're going to keep on saving, Lord, until you come back. Help us, Lord, just to labor in your harvest field, Lord, and preach the word. And God, let, let the lost come to you, Lord, and, and find forgiveness and the greatness of your love and life everlasting freedom in Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.